Welcome back, everyone. Once again, thank you for supporting these videos. If you like these lectures, please like and comment. Follow us on social media for additional content and previews. Links in the description below. And click that subscribe button. Also, check out our new membership section by hitting that join button next to the subscribe button below. We appreciate all your support, and that's what keeps this channel going. Today we're going to continue our discussion on MRI pulse sequence diagrams and pick up where we left off on the previous lecture focused on the standard spin echo sequence. If you didn't catch that lecture, I highly recommend reviewing it before watching this one, link above. So while this sequence allowed us to overcome some of the intrinsic T2 star effects that degrade our image quality, turning an unreadable picture like this into a much prettier picture you bet your health on, we ran into an astounding revelation in that in order to produce this single slice of the head, we would have to run this cycle of pulses and gradients at minimum 128 times according to our classical theory of MRI physics. And as we previously discussed, imaging time is critical. If you can only scan a few patients a day because the process takes so long, there will be a long line of people waiting to get MRI scans, the hospital will lose out on a lot of money, and our poor hospital CEOs won't be able to fly in their private jets, which is critical to being a hospital CEO in the US. So knowing that our imaging time is proportional to the number of phase encoding steps required, the time each cycle takes to perform the time of repetition TR, and then this excitation factor, we're going to have to think outside the box to minimize imaging time and maximize revenue. So let's look at this pulse sequence diagram. Is there really nothing left in the tank, so to speak, after we generate this echo? Curiously, if instead of waiting a long echo time, repeating our 90 degree pulse, then 180 degree rephasing pulse, can we generate more signal if we apply another 180 degree rephasing pulse, again at a time interval of 1 half TE? What do you think will happen? It turns out, in fact, we can do this, producing a second echo which, again, we apply our frequency encoding gradient to while recording the signal. But remember, we will always have losses. The longer our protons spin, the more and more disordered and dephased they become, so our second echo will not be as strong as the previous, which I think makes sense otherwise we could just repeat this indefinitely to get the whole image. Perhaps a more puzzling question is what do we do about this phase encoding gradient? We no longer have a free induction decay to apply it to, but we can't create our picture without applying the different phase encoding gradients at some point in this process. So it turns out we can apply a new phase encoding gradient shortly after the 180 degree pulse and before the second echo. This is where I think it gets more conceptually challenging. What exactly are we applying the gradient to? We don't have signal at this point. Well, we may not have a detectable signal, but that doesn't mean we don't have protons in our slice precessing, just that they are all dephased and not producing signal. So like relationships, it's complicated. We can apply our phase encoding gradient, but it will cause more dephasing to our already dephased spins, which ultimately will impact the strength of our next echo. So let's continue this process. After our second echo, let's apply another 180 degree rephasing pulse at 1 half TE, apply our next phase encoding gradient, and then record the signal from our third echo while once again applying our frequency encoding gradient. Notice once more our third echo is not as strong as our second. We're developing more and more disorder within the system the further we push this. How about a fourth attempt? As expected, the fourth echo is even weaker, so at some point our luck will run out. We apply our next 180 degree rephasing pulse and phase encoding gradient, but we don't produce a detectable echo. At this point, we now need to do the big reset. Waiting for a long time, allowing our protons to realign with the B0Z axis, rebuilding our net magnetizations, so we can restart the process all over again starting with our 90 degree rephasing pulse, which this time produces a free induction decay, just as in the start of the sequence. So we call this pulse sequence the turbo or fast spin echo sequence. The name depends on the MRI machine vendor, and I hope you can see this is a much faster process than our standard spin echo sequence, 
You may be inclined to say, but wait, the standard spin echo sequence appears to have a shorter TR than our turbo fast spin echo sequence. And going back to our formula for imaging time, a longer TR equals a longer imaging time. But this is a perfect example at how test writers try to create these rigid, testable facts for MRI physics, which quickly fall apart at basic questioning. So know this for boards, but don't take it to heart. You can clearly see that this standard spin echo process is much less efficient than our modern day turbo fast spin echo sequence. A few last things to know about this sequence. There is a parameter here that we use to help quantify how this technique can shorten the image acquisition process and save imaging time. Notice how we are making a train of echoes. Yep, that's right, all aboard the echo train. This is also called the turbo factor or shot factor depending on the vendor. But each subsequent echo we produce saves us from going back and restarting the whole process again with a 90 degree pulse. So in this example, we've produced four echoes and our echo train length would be equal to four. In this example, we've produced three echoes, so our echo train length will be equal to three. So what does this mean for our imaging time? As you can see, this immediately gets more complicated as using this sequence will be increasing our TR, but saving time as we're getting more and more phase encoding steps out of each cycle. So in general, they just want you to know that imaging time is inversely proportional to the echo train length. Meaning if our echo train length is four, we cut our imaging time approximately by a quarter compared to our standard spin echo sequence. Back to our turbo fast spin echo sequence pulse diagram, you may also be wondering, what does this do to our image contrast? We're a long ways away from the prior contrast lectures where we can model things as simple T2 decay curves. Well, notice that there's a spacing between the echoes, which we call the echo spacing or inter-echo time. Frustratingly, the naming is also dependent on the manufacturer. And this does in fact affect our image contrast. You've probably all heard the saying when first trying to learn the difference between a T1 and T2 weighted sequence that fat is bright on T1 and CSF and fluid are bright on T2. But look at this T2 weighted image on the right. Fat is also bright on it. So then why do we use this saying? Well, as it turns out, on an old school standard spin echo sequence, fat is not bright on the T2-weighted sequence. It's dark. And in that context, the old saying makes more sense. But one of the consequences of this turbo fast spin echo method is that it does change our image contrast so that fat becomes bright on T2-weighted sequences. And if you look at any modern day T1 or T2-weighted MRI image, fat will be bright on both because of this turbo fast spin echo technique. So then what does dictate image contrast in this complicated looking mess of a sequence? Well, while we don't have our typical T2 decay curves that dictated T2 weighting as detailed in the prior lecture, there is something overall decaying here. Do you see it? If we take a closer look, we do have a gradual decay of the echoes over time. So for the turbo fast spin echo sequence, we have something called an effective TE. There's going to be some part of the sequence that is going to have a dominant effect on image contrast. Is it here? Or here? Well, it's complicated. But in general, the effective TE will be part of the sequence where we generate strong echoes that dominate image contrast. And this will typically be when we apply the lower order phase encoding steps. But remember, we choose the phase encoding gradient strength and when to apply it during this sequence. So the effective TE will vary. Don't get too caught up in this. I just want you to understand what your intuition has probably already told you. That as we get into these more complex sequences, the simplistic notions of image contrast get thrown out the window, and we are going to have to do creative things to make sure our images still follow a pattern of contrast we can use to accurately detect pathology. So on the next episode of MRI Physics Explained, we're going to push the boundaries even further and get into an even more extreme version of the spin echo series of pulse sequences. 
the Haste SSFSE sequences. Hope you're all enjoying this series. Consider becoming a member or donating to keep the content flowing. Be sure to follow us on social media and send in your questions. I read them all and love hearing from all of you out in the community. And we'll see you next time. This is Dr. T.E. signing off.